Hello everybody. So welcome to NEET Crash Course Biology. Now we will be discussing the synopsis of a chapter called Chemical Coordination and Integration. So in Chemical Coordination and Integration, we are mostly going to discuss about endocrine glands. As you all are aware, endocrine glands are those glands which do not have ducts and therefore they are called ductless glands. They produce secretions which are called chemical messengers or hormones. As you can see, it is released directly into the bloodstream because these endocrine glands do not have any ducts. Hormones are today defined as non-nutrient chemicals which act as intercellular messengers. They help in passing messages between the cells and that's why they are called as intercellular messengers. If you go back to invertebrates, they have a very simple endocrine system but only in vertebrates we have a complex endocrine system. So in this particular chapter that is uh, the chemical coordination and integration, we will be mostly focusing on the human endocrine system which is consisting of the endocrine gland and the diffuse tissues and cells which are present throughout the body which produce hormones so there are a lot of other organs which have endocrine cells in them which constantly secrete hormones into the bloodstream so here you have the list of some of the endocrine glands you have the pineal gland the major hypothalamus pituitary thyroid which is located in your throat region parathyroid thymus adrenal gland above your kidney pancreas and even the gonads that is the ovary and the testis also function as endocrine organs there are a lot of other organs which perform some of the endocrine activities like I said your intestine has endocrine cells so your liver secretes certain bioactive substances your kidney also has cells which secrete hormones and your muscles of your heart also secrete certain hormones now you can see the hypothalamus the major part of the brain which is the hypothalamus and see how a structure is suspended from below the hypothalamus and this structure is referred to as the pituitary gland you can see the darker orange part which is referred to as the anterior pituitary and the lighter part which is labeled here as the posterior pituitary so basically there are two lobes in the pituitary gland one is called the anterior pituitary and one is called the posterior pituitary it is very important to remember that there are neurons which are capable of secreting hormones that's why these are called neurosecretory cells and these neurons which are capable of secreting hormones are located within the hypothalamic region and what are they referred to as they are referred to as the hypothalamic hypothalamic neurons did you notice that the axons of these neurons now this projection that is coming out of these neurons is the axon one of the axons the neurons some of the neurons send their axon all the way into the posterior pituitary and they release hormones in the posterior pituitary which acts as a storage organ and then this posterior pituitary releases these hormones into the bloodstream so some of these neurosecretory cells send out their axons directly to the posterior pituitary but if you consider some other endocrine uh, neurosecretory cells such as what I have labeled right now, you can see that the axon is not as elongated. It pours its secretion into a system of blood vessels, a capillary network that is referred to as the portal circulation. The portal circulation is the one that brings these hormones to the anterior pituitary and cells of the anterior pituitary will in turn produce hormones. So basically you should remember that there is a portal circulation between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary whereas the hypothalamic neurons send out their axons directly to the posterior pituitary. Now hormones released by hypothalamus can be classified into releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones. Releasing hormones will stimulate the pituitary gland. See they have a stimulating effect on the pituitary gland. They have a positive effect on the pituitary gland. They stimulate the pituitary gland to release certain hormones. That's why as the name itself indicates they are called releasing hormones. Inhibiting horm hormones will put the pituitary gland to sleep. They will tell the pituitary gland that you don't have to secrete any hormone. So if the hypothalamus is inhibiting the pituitary gland then it does so by releasing certain hormones called as inhibiting hormones so from the previous slide it is very clear that the pituitary gland is under the direct control of hypothalamus
the best example for releasing hormone is gonadotropin releasing hormone the gonadotropin releasing hormone released by the hypothalamus will act on the anterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary cells will get stimulated by the gonadotropin releasing hormone and they enter in turn will release a group of hormones called gonadotropin so if there is a hormone which is stimulating the cells of anterior pituitary such as gonadotropin releasing hormone then we refer to it as a releasing hormone there are certain hormones like somatostatin and when somatostatin is released by the hypothalamus it tells the pituitary gland to stop making growth hormone so because it tells the pituitary gland to stop making growth hormone we cannot call somatostatin as um, releasing hormone what should we call it we should call it an inhibiting hormone because it has a negative influence on the pituitary gland so basically the hypothalamus i spoke of hypothalamus and the neurosecretory cells which are present in the hypothalamus those are the most important neurons which directly control the secretions of both the anti and the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland once again here you have to remember that the neurons will send out their axons all the way to the posterior pituitary but how do the neurons send their hormones to the anterior pituitary via a special circulatory pathway what is that circulatory pathway called it is called the portal circulation so this is what I was telling you just now that hypothalamic neurons pass their axons all the way and they are released from their nerve endings and please remember they pass their axons all the way to the posterior pituitary but how does the hormone reach the anterior pituitary just now I told you the neurons do not have that lengthier axon so they release their secretion into a special type of circulatory system which is referred to as the portal circulation and that carries the hormone hormones of hypothalamus specifically to wit pituitary gland to the anterior part of the pituitary gland to the posterior part there is no need of any circulation because axons from hypothalamus are directly extending into the posterior pituitary so we can see that the pituitary gland is situated in a bony cup shaped depression at the floor of your cranium or the brain box which is formed out of your sphenoid bone which is called the cella tersica and remember that the pituitary gland is attached by a narrow stalk which is called infundibulum to your hypothalamus please remember that hypothalamus is a part of your brain from which hangs down the pituitary gland and it hangs down a stalk which is referred to as the infundibulum and pituitary gland has two parts Parts, that is adenohypophysis and neurohypophysis now if this is the hypothalamus please remember from the hypothalamus you have a stalk and then you have the posterior pituitary gland so this is the posterior pituitary gland so let me label this as pars nervosa pars nervosa is the posterior pituitary gland it is also called neurohypophysis as you can see here this is the posterior pituitary gland or the neurohypophysis okay now where is the anterior pituitary gland in the front you can see the anterior pituitary gland over here and it also has a highly vascular portion and this vascular portion of the anterior pituitary which wraps around what does it wrap around it wraps around the stalk of the pituitary gland now what is the stalk of the pituitary gland called the stalk of the pituitary gland is referred to as the infundibulum okay and then you have this particular stalk okay which or just let us say just let us simply refer to it as the stalk of the pituitary gland and that is wrapped around by this tubular portion of the anterior pituitary the tubular portion is called pars tubularis and the bulged portion is called the pars distalis so pars tubularis and pars distalis are the two parts of adenohypophysis or anterior pituitary the stalk or the infundibulum and what is referred to as the bulged part over here see this bulged part is what is actually the posterior pituitary gland and actually there is another very thin lobe sitting in between let me put dots here now this lobe that is sitting in between why don't we consider it anymore because it has fused with the pars distalis of the anterior lobe of pituitary gland and this lobe which is very very reduced in humans and it is fused with the pars distalis is referred to as the pars intermedia 
it is also called the intermediate lobe of the pituitary gland so now you saw that the pituitary gland has pars tubularis the tubular portion which is highly vascularized and wraps around the stalk and then you have a bulged portion called pars distalis together that make up the anterior pituitary or adenohypophysis and then the posterior part is directly connected to the hypothalamus through a stalk and the bulged part of the posterior lobe or the pituitary gland is nothing but the pars nervosa or the posterior pituitary and whatever lies above the pituitary gland is the portion of the brain where we saw those special neurons are sitting over there and these neurons I told you are called the hypothalamic neurons or they are called neurosecretory cells because they contain neurohormones, they secrete hormones in them. Is it clear? So here they have given you a quick review of what are the different hormones that are secreted by the pituitary gland. We have the adenohypophysis I just told you is made up of two parts, pars distalis and pars tubularis. We have neurohypophysis that is pars nervosa. So the different hormones of pars and I told you very clearly that the pars intermedia is almost merged with the anterior pituitary. There is only one hormone secreted by pars intermedia that is melanocyte stimulating hormone. Otherwise you have have the hormone secreted by the pars distalis which includes growth hormone prolactin tsh or thyroid stimulating hormone acth or adrenocorticotropic hormone and the last two hormones which are called lh and fsh collectively are called gonadotropins they are called gonadotropins because they have a tropic meaning a stimulatory effect on the gonad that is the testis and the ovary then if you see the neurohypophysis i told you that the posterior lobe of pituitary gland is referred to as the neurohypophysis or the pars nervosa which receives axons directly from the hypothalamic neurons it makes only it releases i told you they don't secrete hormones of their own they just store the hormones that is coming from the hypothalamus and release them as and when your body requires the two major hormones released by your posterior pituitary or neurohypophysis is oxytocin and vasopressin and both of them see here this step is very very important both both oxytocin and vasopressin are synthesized in the hypothalamus and how are they transported to the neurohypophysis? Axonally, through the axon they are transported to the neurohypophysis. So neurohypophysis is not secreting them, it is just releasing them. It is not producing them, it is just releasing them whereas the anterior pituitary it receives hormones from hypothalamus and it itself produces the following hormones okay so there is a difference between being able to produce and being able to just store and release it so the one that produces the hormones in response to the hypothalamic hormones is the adenohypophysis or the anterior pituitary and the one that only stores the hormones and releases it timely as and when your body requires it that is referred to as the neurohypophysis so growth hormone if there is excessive growth hormone release in case of children it causes gigantism if there is low secretion of growth hormone in children it causes pituitary dwarfism and here i would like to mention that over secretion of growth hormone in adults mostly adults of middle age group it's very important to remember if adults exhibit over secretion of growth hormone it results in a condition that is called acromegaly acromegaly causes severe Severe disfigurement especially of the facial bones the lower jaw bone becomes massive in size the eyebrow ridges project outwards the bones of the face the bones of the hand and the feet all of them become disproportionately large and this disease which is referred to as acromegaly the skin of the face and the hand become very very thick and pigmented and this is the most important disease that is referred to as a deficiency sorry a hyper secretion condition a disease where there is excessive growth hormone in middle-aged adults so when i say adults you should remember it is mostly in middle-aged adults the symptoms show up very slowly and once if it is uh, if it shows up if it is not treated it can also lead to it can also be fatal to the person so excessive secretion so gigantism is excessive secretion in children but acromegaly is excessive secretion in adult and dwarfism is low secretion or see for excessive secretion we use the word hyper secretion and for low secretion we use the word dwarfism 
there is another hormone by the anterior pituitary please remember here we are talking about the hormones of the anterior pituitary and you by now know that the anterior pituitary is called the adenohypophysis which is made up of a bulged part called pars distalis and a tubular part called pars tubularis correct it also releases a hormone the anterior pituitary or the adenohypophysis also releases a very important hormone that is referred to as prolactin which regulates the growth of mammary glands and stimulates the formation of milk in them <coughs> then the further the hormones of anterior pituitary include the thyroid stimulating hormone which stimulates the thyroid gland to secrete its own hormones like tsh and uh, sorry t3 and t4 ACTH that acts on the adrenal cortex that is adrenocorticotropic hormone which stimulates the release of glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids from the superficial layer of your adrenal gland the superficial layer of your adrenal gland is nothing but the adrenal cortex then we have LH and FSH which is released by anterior pituitary again please remember here we are talking about adenohypophysis or anterior pituitary and LH and FSH are called gonadotropins because they have a tropic or a stimulatory effect on the testis and ovary in males what does LH do in males the luteinizing hormone or LH acts on a specific cells called Leydig cells in the testis and it stimulates the release of androgen the major member of the androgen family as you all are aware is testosterone in male what does FSH do FSH also helps in regulating the process of sperm formation which is referred to as spermatogenesis FSH along with the androgen that is secreted by the cells of the testis in response to LH so remember Remember, LH acts on cells of the testis which are called Leydig cells and stimulates the release of androgen whereas FSH helps in the process of spermatogenesis androgen which is testosterone also helps in the process of spermatogenesis in females what does LH do in females LH induces a process where there is release of egg this release of egg by the ovary is called ovulation and once the egg is released from the ovary a yellow colored structure is formed inside the ovary called corpus luteum and LH is a hormone that keeps the corpus luteum alive and it stimulates the corpus luteum in order to prepare or produce and release the pregnancy hormone that is called progesterone and what does FSH do in the case of female Body, it stimulates the development of follicles inside the ovary the primary secondary tertiary and graphene follicle during the proliferative or the follicular stage of the menstrual cycle in the second stage of the menstrual cycle we saw that there is a thin lobe between the anterior and pitu posterior pituitary which is basically the intermediate lobe so MSH is nothing but a hormone of the intermediate lobe of pituitary it secretes a hormone called melanin melanocyte stimulating hormone actually MSH stands for melanocyte stimulating hormone that acts on pigment cells in your skin which is referred to as melanocytes and this will uh, modify the pigmentation the coloration of the skin now coming to so I will put a dashed line here now these are what I'm going to rest, uh, uh, tell you about here are hormones which are released by neurohypophysis by now you know that neurohypophysis means posterior pituitary gland I told you that the neurohypophysis release these hormones but actually they are coming from the posterior I mean from the hypothalamus oxytocin is responsible for vigorous contraction of uterus and also helps in milk ejection from the mammary gland and the other hormone that is referred to as the vasopressin secreted by the posterior pituitary again please remember this is secreted by this is uh, released by the neurohypophysis I hope all of you remember actually the hormones in the neurohypophysis are coming from the hypothalamus the neurohypophysis does not secrete any hormones of its own the neurohypophysis simply stores these hormones which are coming in from the hypothalamus and release is it as and when your body requires it so two hormones that is released by the neurohypophysis the first one I discussed in the previous slide 
that is oxytocin and the second one it is in this slide that is vasopressin vasopressin is also called antidiuretic hormone because it ensures that water and electrolytes are taken back from your urine into the blood and therefore it will prevent production of dilute urine you will not lose water in urine and when you lose water in urine it is called diuresis but it prevents loss of water in urine loss of excessive water and dehydration in urine and as a result it is called antidiuretic loss of excess water in urine is called diuresis but since it acts against diuresis it makes sure that your nephron absorbs water and ions back into your blood the urine becomes concentrated so you will not lose much water in your urine and that is why it is called antidiuretic hormone then we have the pineal gland which is the uh, which is situated at the uh, midbrain see here at the back of your midbrain you have a structure here that is referred to as the pineal gland the pineal gland is located on the dorsal side of the forebrain it's written as forebrain but please remember it can be considered as a part of the midbrain just above the corpora quadrigemina you can see the two swollen structures here which make up the corpora quadrigemina remember this actually there are four rounded structures but you can only see two because it is a section of the brain and you're seeing only one half of the brain it secretes a very important hormone that is called melatonin and what does melatonin do melatonin regulates your 24 hour rhythm in your body 12 hour day and 12 hour night rhythm it also regulates your sleep wake cycle your body temperature your metabolism pigmentation and in females it regulates menstrual cycle it has a role to play in defense mechanism or immunity thyroid gland as you can see in your thyroid region in your larynx you can see this bilobed organ that is situated connected together by a narrow bridge over here you can see there are two lobes one on the right side one on the left side and then you are connecting the two there is a connection which is referred to as the isthmus which connects the two lobes and you can see these circular aggregations of cells now these circular aggregations of cells are referred to as the thyroid follicles within which there are specific cells called f cells or follicle cells or the principal cells which are the ones that actually secrete the thyroid hormone so let us see what are the thyroid hormones i just told you that those circular structures are called follicles they are made up of specialized cells called the principal cells so remember inside the follicle you have the principal cells or the F cells. So F cells or the principal cells are basically present in the thyroid gland and they basically secrete tetraiodothyronine or thyroxine that is T4 and triiodothyronine which is T3. Okay. Then basically like I said yeah it's a repetition again T4 is called tetraiodothyronine or thyroxine and the hormone triiodothyronine is T3 secreted by the thyroid follicle. Now the most important thing is if a person is suffering from deficiency of iodine you can see how the thyroid gland swells up and whenever there is deficiency in iodine there is reduced production of thyroid hormone but there is over stimulation of thyroid gland from the hormone released by the pituitary that results in the thyroid gland undergoing hypertrophy or enlargement this enlargement that is seen in people who are deficient in iodine is referred to as goiter and then if the mother is uh, during pregnancy if the mother is hypothyroidic then she will give birth to a child who is suffering from cretinism and what are some of the features of the child suffering from cretinism there is mental retardation deaf mutism abnormal skin low iq in adult the hypothyroidism can result in a derangement in uh, menstrual cycle okay so it can result in derangement of menstrual cycle where the menstrual cycle becomes irregular this is mostly in adult women who are suffering from a condition referred to as hypothyroidism uh, and then one important thing is sometimes due to the cancer of thyroid gland the person may start producing excess amount of thyroid hormones and that excess amount of thyroid hormones is referred to as hyperthyroidism isn't it so development of thyroid uh, excess um, tumor sometimes in the thyroid hormone and one important thing is in the adults in the adults if there is hyperthyroidism this is something you should remember in the adult if there is hyperthyroidism it results in a condition that is called eggs of thalamic goiter 
so this they may ask in your examination excessive production of thyroid gland in adults in the previous section we saw in a woman if there is low amount of thyroid hormone then she will suffer from menstrual derangement but in adults if there is excessive production of thyroid hormone that is hyperthyroidism it will result in protrusion of the eyeballs very very high basal metabolic rate and tendency for weight loss when that is referred to as exophthalmic goiter so these are the functions of the thyroid hormone they regulate the basal metabolic rate they support the process of rbc formation they control the metabolism of carbohydrates proteins and fats they maintain water and electrolyte balance thyroid hormone the thyroid gland other than the follicle cells there are other cells which are referred to as the c cells and the para follicular cells or the c cells secrete a hormone that is referred to as the thyrocalcitonin and this thyrocalcitonin plays a very important role in regulating the blood calcium level please remember it lowers the blood calcium level so it is called the hypocalcemic hormone why is it called hypocalcemic hormone because it has a lowering effect on the blood calcium level parathyroid gland has is, is uh, are usually these four glands which are situated just behind the pituitary gland and they secrete the hormone that is called parathyroid hormone parathyroid hormone has an effect which is completely different from that of what we saw in uh, calcitonin i told you that calcitonin is a hypocalcemic hormone but parathormone is a hypercalcemic hormone when i say hypercalcemic hormone you should say that it increases the blood calcium level how does it increase the blood calcium level by causing your bones to dissolve that is referred to as bone resorption or dissolution or demineralization when the bones dissolve they will release a lot of calcium which reaches into your blood and therefore your blood calcium level increases it also makes sure that your nephron reabsorbs more calcium from the urine and it also helps in absorption of calcium from your digested food so please remember the two most important antagonistic hormones here are thyrocalcitonin which lowers the calcium level in the blood it was called hypocalcemic hormone now we call this parathormone as hypercalcemic hormone because it increases your blood calcium level so i just discussed about the role of parathormone and here you can see very clearly parathormone is called para uh, the hypercalcemic hormone because it increases the reabsorption of calcium and from your renal tubules and your digested food then you have thymus gland situated above your heart just below your breast bone it produces a hormone a protein hormone or a peptide hormone that is called thymosin which plays a very important role in release or in uh, taking care of the t lymphocytes and helping the t lymphocytes to perform their function and this is referred to as cell mediated immunity it also helps in another type of immunity that is called humoral immunity which usually consists of antibodies which are circulating in all your body fluids like for example your plasma and there is antibodies also present in the mucus lining your respiratory tract your urinogenital tract isn't it so that is basically regulated by the humoral immunity and in older people as we grow older what happens is the thymus starts regenerating as a result in older people the immune responses come down adrenal gland very important we have a pair of adrenal gland on each of our kidney it has a superficial zone that is referred to as the adrenal cortex and a deeper zone in the adrenal gland which is referred to as the adrenal medulla so here you can see the superficial zone is referred to as the adrenal cortex you can very clearly see the distinction between the superficial zone and the deeper zone that is in the adrenal region is referred to as the adrenal medulla so in this picture you can see how a section of the adrenal gland has been taken and you can see two distinct zones an outer cortex and an inner medulla now very importantly we will first talk about the hormones which are released by the adrenal medulla they are called catecholamines collectively the catecholamines together include uh, adrenaline or epinephrine and noradrenaline or norepinephrine and these are referred to as the emergency hormone or hormones of fight or flight or fright and these are released in your body whenever you're facing an emergency situation so remember this is the hormone of the deeper part of your adrenal gland that is called the adrenal medulla 
and some of the important responses when you are in a heightened state of mind is basically you have pupillary dilation your your pupil undergoes dilation your raising of your body hair there is increased sweating your heart starts contracting you start breathing at a faster rate and it also makes sure that it breaks down glycogen because you need energy to face that emotionally heightened state Catecholamines also stimulate the breakdown of lipids and proteins because I just told you that during an emergency situation you need a lot of energy. Then we saw how the adrenal cortex is divided into three zones. The three zones are zona reticularis, the zona fasciculata and the outermost zona glomerulosa. So you can see how the adrenal cortex here is composed of three major zones. The outermost zone is called the zona glomerulosa. Then you have cords of cells which are arranged in bundles called zona fasciculata and then you have a net work zone which is referred to as the zona reticularis. The hormones secreted by the adrenal glands are called corticoids. There are major corticoids such as glucocorticoid. You have to remember glucocorticoid is a stress hormone. The major stress hormone that regulates the metabolism of carbohydrates in your body is cortisol. There is another group of hormones secreted by the adrenal cortex which is referred to as mineralocorticoid. Aldosterone is the major mineralocorticoid and glucocorticoid I told you is the cortisol which stimulates production of glucose from non-carbohydrates because your body is in stress. I told you glucocorticoid cortisol is a stress hormone so when your body is in stress it needs more energy source so it makes glucose from new compounds. It does not allow other cells, non-critical cells to take up amino acid. It regulates your heart and kidney functions when you are under stressful conditions and glucocorticoid that is your cortisol will also prevent inflammatory reaction because it has a suppressive effect on your immune response that's why if you're constantly stressed you are going to fall sick because the cortisol will make sure that your immune response is suppressed it also stimulates rbc production and i told you the mineralocorticoid so we just completed discussing cortisol or glucocorticoid the mineralocorticoid that we need to learn here is aldosterone. Aldosterone stimulates the reabsorption of sodium and excretion of potassium and calcium and phosphate, even calcium also from your renal tubules. Thus, aldosterone maintains body fluid volume, osmotic pressure and blood pressure and the zona reticular is the innermost zone of your adrenal cortex may release certain hormones which are called androgenic steroids and these androgenic steroids usually play a role in the sexual characters like growth of hairs in your underarm, in your pubic or the genital region and the facial hair during puberty. So pancreas is a dual or a compound gland because as you can see pancreas has two parts. What are the two parts in the pancreas? It has an endocrine part which is called islets of Langerhans and the exocrine part is mostly involved in the secretion of the pancreatic juice. The pancreas has about 1 to 2 million islets of Langerhans but it makes up only 1 to 2 percent of pancreatic tissue. In this chapter since we are talking about the endocrine system we are concerned about the islets of Langerhans. There are two cells in the islets of Langerhans which are called alpha cells and beta cells. The alpha cells secrete a hormone that is called glucagon and the beta cells secrete a hormone called insulin and it's important to note here that glucagon is responsible for increasing your blood glucose level. So glucagon is called as the hyperglycemic factor. Supposing you haven't had a meal, you're starving, so it increases your blood glucose level. After you had a meal, your blood glucose increases and that is brought down by insulin and that is referred to that's why insulin is referred to as the hypoglycemic factor Testis is uh, actually um, the primary sex organ. It consists of seminiferous tubules where the sperm are produced and it has interstitial tissue. In the interstitial tissue, there are Leydig cells which secrete, we have already discussed about this, the Leydig cells under the influence of LH. LH stimulates the Leydig cells in order to prepare a hormone that is referred to as androgens. Okay. Then we have androgens which usually help in uh, uh, maintenance of your male accessory sex ducts and then and they also play a stimulatory role in the process of sperm formation that is called spermatogenesis. Androgens also help in muscular growth, uh, growth of facial and axillary hair, aggressiveness in male, low pitch voice. These are some of the secondary sexual characters in male. So when I talk about androgens, all of you should remember one thing. One of the major members of the androgen family is the testosterone. 
androgens act on central nervous system and stimulate the male sexual behavior that is called libido they also have a synthetic effect on carbohydrate metabolism that's why steroids are taken androgens are steroids and such steroid hormones are taken for body building because they have anabolic or synthetic effects on protein and carbohydrate metabolism in our body ovary now ovary just like how testis is to male ovary is to female it has it is the primary female sex organ it usually undergoes cyclical changes and produces ovum during menstrual cycle the principal hormone of the ovary is the progesterone and the estrogen the estrogen is called the female sex hormone whereas the progesterone is referred to as the pregnancy hormone and ovary is consisting of ovarian follicles and stromal tissue now this ovary that is estrogen that is synthesized by the ovarian follicle and once the ovarian follicle ruptures and the egg comes out i had told you that the uh, graafian follicle will organize itself into a yellow colored mass that is referred to as corpus luteum which secretes under the influence of lh again lh stimulates the corpus luteum to secrete the pregnancy hormone to ready the uterine lining in case there is pregnancy and that is referred to as the progesterone hormone and then we saw estrogen also has an effect on the secondary sexual characters in female development of uh, ovarian fol follicles development of female secondary sexual characters like high pitch and also the development of the mammary gland and progesterone also has a role to play in milk secretion because it acts on the alveoli which are sac like structures present within the mammary gland most important function of progesterone however is to support pregnancy by readying the uterine by maintaining the thickening of the endometrial lining and that's why progesterone is referred to as the pregnancy hormone then we had seen that the heart and kidney and gi tract release a lot of hormones the hormone of your heart is called atrial natriuretic factor it is released whenever your blood pressure is high so that to counteract the high blood pressure the wall of your heart releases the atrial natriuretic factor it reduces the blood pressure it also stimulates the juxta glomerular so yeah this is about anf anf is done over here and then we have the um, hormone of your kidney your kidney releases a hormone called erythropoietin and these erythropoietin will stimulate the formation of rbc in your bone marrow this process where rbcs are produced is referred to as erythropoiesis okay then endocrine cells present in your stomach and your intestine release for example in your stomach they release a hormone called gastrin gastrin stimulates the secretion of gastric juice and secretin is stimulated released by endocrine cells of the duodenum secretin stimulates the secretion of bicarbonate ions in the pancreas and secretion of bile in the liver as well as it blocks the trans, uh, release of gastric juice in the stomach and inhibits the gut motility cholecystokinin is a hormone which stimulates the release of bile from the gall bladder and uh, gastric inhibitory peptide or introgastrin is again a hormone of the intestinal gland which inhibits the gastric movement and which inhibits the secretion of the gastric juice so remember your stomach and intestine also have lot of endocrine cells which secrete a lot of hormones so we have i have already discussed the functions of all of these hormones here okay now how exactly do hormones act hormones have to go and bind to their target cells on specific hormone receptors the receptors may either be on the cell surface in the case of membrane bound receptors or they may be inside the nucleus as intracellular or nuclear receptors now they form once the hormone goes and binds to the receptor it forms a complex that is referred to as the hormone receptor complex and the receptor is very specific to the particular hormone that it binds and when the hormone receptor is formed the complex is formed it will bring about certain changes biochemical and functional changes within the target cell it is very important that once the hormone goes to its target cell it has to form a hormone receptor complex by binding to the receptor then you have different groups of hormones like peptide hormone hypothalamic hormones then you have pituitary hormones insulin glucagon or or all hormones which are basically protein they are called peptide or polypeptide or protein hormones then you have steroid hormones like you have cortisol testosterone estradiol and progesterone and you have amino acid derivatives like epinephrine and uh, hormones which contain iodine in them like iodothyronines which are thyroid so this is very very important you have have to learn the different classes of hormones based on their biochemical nature along with appropriate examples 
then when they bind to membrane bound receptor they release certain chemical substances in the cytoplasm called cyclic amp inositol triphosphate and calcium ions which are referred to as second messengers so once the hormone receptor complex is formed the second messengers are activated and these second messengers will do further action inside the cell they will bring about certain changes in the biochemical pathway and physiological activities of the cell so here you can see how a follicle stimulating hormone so it acts on the ovary so they have taken the ovarian cell membrane for example see how the hormone is coming and sitting on the receptor now once it binds to the receptor as you can see here it is forming a hormone receptor complex and then it leads to a chain reaction inside the cell mediated by special molecules which are called secondary messengers this chain reaction results in changes happening in cellular mechanism cellular pathways that is called biochemical responses ultimately resulting in changes in the functioning of of the cell so because of fsh what happens to the ovarian cell the ovarian cell will start multiplying it will start growing and ultimately leading to ovarian growth so here did you all notice one thing that the receptor is situated on the cell membrane of the target cell so it is called a membrane bound receptor but if you talk about intracellular receptor see how the hormone in this particular case it is a steroid hormone estrogen it is not binding to a receptor on the uterine cell membrane in the previous case we saw that there was a receptor on the cell membrane of ovarian cell but here on the uterine cell membrane there is no receptor notice how the hormone is directly entering into the uterine cell why uterine cell because uterine cell is the target for this hormone which is called estrogen it is directly entering into the uterine cell and once it enters it is crossing the nuclear membrane and in the nucleus you can see how it is binding to this receptor this what i have highlighted in red now this is the receptor to which this estrogen binds to and once it forms or once this green molecule which is estrogen binds to the receptor you can see that the most important complex that is hormone receptor complex is formed and this surprisingly the hormone receptor complex can go and directly act on the dna that is the genetic material of the cell and it can stimulate the production of proteins in your cell which will help in changing the functions of your uterine cell such as it will allow growth of your uterine cell and differentiation of the endometrial tissue so in both the cases you saw hormone has to bind to the receptor either receptor present on the cell membrane in case of follicle stimulating hormone and this receptor can you see this receptor is located inside the cell so is it called a membrane bound receptor or an intracellular receptor it is called an intracellular receptor it is located in uh, the nucleus of the target cell so please remember receptors are of two types that is membrane bound receptors and intracellular receptors okay so with this we complete the synopsis of the chapter chemical coordination and intra, uh, integration thank you